Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Cheryl. Hi, nice to see everyone this morning. Good morning, Cheryl. Hi, Brian. Brian, are you going to play us a tune? I see some uh, musical instruments uh, behind you. Uh, if you want, sure, that's uh, totally possible. Yeah, wouldn't that Brian? be something if we took requests? Okay, I'm not sure. I'm not good at requests. I'm an original artist mostly, but I may have have uh, your request in my repertoire. <laughs> or I'm a good I'm a good fake. I can fake it too. I've I've heard you play many times. Welcome to our attendees as you're loading in. Uh, we're just waiting a few minutes for everyone to get here. Okay. So it's 1030. Um, I think we might get started. Margo, if you want to start us off. Well, I hope everybody had a good long weekend. And I appreciate that um, Tuesday morning after a long weekend may not be the best time to take out of their schedules. Uh, however, I think that Sam and I and um, Ermira and Maison, when we were planning these, there wasn't a lot going on today. So we chose this day only to find out that there's about nine forums happening. So it's gonna be a busy day to be discussing both federal and municipal events. I would like to welcome all the guests and candidates to the 2021 Edmonton Mayoral Forum to discuss some of the issues that are important to people with disabilities in this municipal election. We are recording this session to be posted on our YouTube channel after the event. I'm going to have Sam start out with some accessibility features and how to use some of the functions on this Zoom webinar. Thanks, Sam. Thank you, Margo. Um, I will briefly go over some of the features and controls on the webinar. Um, you should already be able to see that we have live cart captioning being provided by Carol. So thank you, Carol. Uh, if you don't see them, you can turn them on by clicking the CC or live transcript button on the far right of your Zoom controls. We also, I have placed in the chat the screen for captions that you can open up as well, if that's a preferred way. And I'll put it again in case anyone's joined us. Um, we regret to inform the audience today that due to unforeseen circumstances, we were not able to secure ASL interpreters for the session. We are deeply apologetic to anyone who relies on that service. We will, however, get someone to do an ASL overlay for when we upload this video to our YouTube and social media after the fact. Um, so I hope that is a passable solve um, for the unfortunate um, events that we found ourselves in. If you do have any questions for the candidates, please feel free to put them into the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, just to the left of the captioning button. Should you have any technical or accessibility difficulties throughout the event, please send them via chat, uh, which should be the first button on the left, to our panelists, and one of our team will be able to work with you to rectify that. Excellent. We will um, start out with the land acknowledgement. And we acknowledge that we, were on, we are on traditional territories in Alberta of the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. Today, we are joining from Treaty 6 territory, a traditional meeting ground, gathering place, and traveling route to the Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, Dene, Nakota Sioux, 
and specifically the ancestral space of the Papischis Cree Nation. Hi, hi. This morning's event is being hosted by two provincial organizations who bring the voice of people with disabilities into conversations like this that bring to attention the lived experience so that leadership is aware of the disability lens when making decisions affecting their constituents. The area that we are focusing on is the responsibility of all three levels of government. And today we are focusing on the city of Edmonton and inviting the mayoral candidates to speak to the areas of accessibility and answering questions that have, we have received from our constituents, constituency. My name is Margot Bruner and I am the Executive Director of Voice of Albertans with Disabilities. Since 1973, our mandate has remained the same with guiding principles. Full participation. We are committed to breaking down barriers which prevent society from seeing beyond our disabilities so that we are included in all aspects of life. We will take charge of the social, political, and economic decisions that affect our lives. We must be accountable for our actions. We must have choice in the services and supports that we require and we acknowledge and accept the dignity of risk. Accessibility. All buildings and facilities must be accessible. Transportation, information and communication services must meet our diverse needs. Equity. We will be vigilant to ensure that our rights and freedoms are upheld. We claim our right to be equal while maintaining our individuality. We are sharing our forums with an advocacy group from Calgary who share the same guiding principles and work towards full citizenship for all Albertans and specifically those who live with disabilities and those who support them. The Alberta Ability Network, formerly Calgary Ability Network, is the collaboration of stakeholders, people with lived experience and those who support them, health practitioners, community advocates, and government that strives to address systemic barriers facing people with disabilities, strengthen the disability sector, and influence policy and decision making. Sam, who is moderating the forum today is our accessibility coordinator and without her, I would have been lost in the nav navigation of most of the technology in this past 15 months. I am and will be eternally grateful. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Uh, so now. So now we will, we'll, we will allow the candidates one minute for introduction. Um, introducing themselves in al alphabetical order by last name. And I was trying to think of an icebreaker for this one and I did invite um, um, Brian Breezy Greg to play a song, but that might take longer than a minute. So um, if you could just introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your background. Um, we will get to the questions about uh, working through the accessibility issues in the city of Edmonton, but for now, this is a simple one minute introduction. Starting with Rick Comrie. Is Rick in the audience? Yeah. You're just muted, Rick. Can you hear me? Yeah. You can hear me now? Are you able to hear me, dear? Yeah, we can hear you. 
Yes. You can. Wonder if you can hear me now, is that better? Yeah. Okay, hi, I'm Rick Comrie, lifetime resident business owner and now mayor candidate. My family's journey began in the Edmonton area in the early 1900s. And we've seen the city of Edmonton grow to an, an enormous size. And quite frankly, we're trying too hard to be something we're not. Having talking to all the people with disabilities, we must accommodate. It's imperative that we accommodate every facility to meet the demand of people with disabilities. I'm in total favor. Thanks for ha uh, having me today, and I'll pass on. Uh, I'll pass on now. Thanks again for having me. Thank you, Rick, and Brian Breezy Greg. One minute. Thanks very much. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Brian Breezy Greg. Uh, born in Edmonton, I'm the oldest candidate in this race. And uh, I feel like uh, I bring quite a bit of lived experience to understanding uh, uh, the problems that people with disabilities face. Uh, I'm disabled myself. I, I am suffer from bipolar disorder. And uh, I experienced in the 70s, uh, five years of in and out of Alberta hospital with electroshock therapy being put in solitary confinement and, and taking a lot of very, very heavy drugs. I managed to recover from that just by my own determination. And then I was clear for 25 years. And then I, under the, like uh, bipolar is, is a stress thing. I, I was, uh, I ran for mayor in 98 and the stress of it brought me to another episode, but I have to report uh, the mental health system in that 25 years improved so drastically. And they taught me how to take care of myself. And since 1998, I haven't had another uh, manic episode. So. I feel like I have a, a good lived experience that way. And also last year during the uh, initial stages of the pandemic, I lost my eyesight. So I was technical, technically blind until I had uh, surgery. And at the same time, I lost uh, my mobility with my knee. So I have, you know, some lived experience of what it's like to be disabled. And um, I'm totally for making our city a, a safe and welcoming place for disabled people with all kinds of different disabilities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Kim Cruchel, one minute. I would like to start by thanking the Alberta Network and Voice of Albertans with Disabilities for organizing this forum. And I think disabilities are important and we need to be accessible to people who are dealing with disabilities. I believe our city is at a pivotal point in time and our next mayor will need to hit the ground running, have a real understanding of how our city works to affect change and an appreciation for what it's like to be an entrepreneur and run a business. And I have that experience. I spent nearly two decades in municipal government, then left politics in 2013 to help care for my in-laws. And in 2015, I got into business and have co-founded two successful tech companies. But I'm returning to politics because I care about Edmonton and our collective future. We need jobs and opportunity and a city where all of us feel included, safe, and connected. Since launching my campaign, I've been listening to Edmontonians and building my plan for our city based on four core pillars, a vibrant and connected city, economic recovery and growth, core services and maintenance with a focus on customer service, and supports for our most vulnerable. But let's be real, no platform can anticipate everything that our city and council will face over the next four years, and nor should it. So I think what voters need to know is what you can expect from me as your mayor. In short, I bring a balanced and bold approach, and I have a track record of getting things done for our city. I am for Edmonton, and thank you. Thank you, Kim. Michael Oshry, one minute. I'll stay within the one minute. Um, well, thank you very much for having me. I, I appreciate this opportunity uh, to talk to the community. Um, just a really quick background uh, about me. I was on city council for four years from 2013 to 2017. So I have that experience of how the city works and, and, and uh, what it takes to operate it. Um, otherwise, my background's in business. I, I own a few different businesses around town, one of them quite large, I'll say, that has offices in different countries around the world. And, you know, this is a real, really tough time in the city. We're going to have to make some tough 
tough, tough decisions. You know, the economic reality of the city is really challenging and there's a lot of people that also need help. And one of our core platform pieces is Edmonton for everyone. And we want to make sure that everyone has the same opportunity to succeed as I'm fortunate enough to have had in the past. Uh, and I look forward to the discussions and hearing from everyone about uh, what you all think is needed in the city. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Hammerjeet Sohi, one minute. You're muted, Mr. Sohi. I want to thank uh, the organizers for starting this uh, gathering by acknowledging uh, the land that we are gathered on. Uh, that land acknowledgement is, has a deep meaning for me. I came to this uh, city and this country with nothing. I struggled a lot, faced a lot of racism, discrimination, and barriers to participation. So I understand the challenges that people with disabilities face because I faced a similar type barriers because, I, because of my uh, my life circumstances. Uh, I deeply believe in this city. This city has propelled me to live up to my fullest potential, being a city councillor, then being a member of parliament, and then serving in two major economic portfolios, infrastructure and natural resources, delivering billions of dollars for communities from coast to coast to coast. My vision for Edmonton is that I was able to gain access and opportunities here and every Edmontonian should be able to live to their fullest potential. So my vision is Edmonton for all of us. Edmonton where we can thrive together. Edmonton that has the ability to participate and access services and programs for everyone. Thank you, Amarjeet. And Cheryl Watson, one minute. Or Diana Steele, that was my fault. Diana first. Go ahead then. Okay. Thank you for inviting us here today. I am running for mayor of our city to offer a different kind of leader. I am currently a community leader who has been on the ground every day for seven years. I have a well-rounded platform, an excellent work experience and a master's degree in leadership. I am a big fan of servant leaders because they behave as true elected representatives of the people. It is not about electing me as the mayor. It is about giving a voice to all Edmontonians through me. We are looking at quality of life issues here. We have communities of people that are being left behind and I will be your voice. Thank you. Thank you, Diana, and my apologies. I, um, I'm a little far away from my screen to read that there was an addition, but we appreciate that. And Sh Cheryl Watson, one minute. Thank you, really appreciate the opportunity to speak to this community. This is the most important election that we've had in nearly a decade. And so any opportunity that we have to be able to speak and listen is really fantastic. So thank you. I'm a born and raised Edmontonian. I grew up in the north side of the city in the community of Beverly. And much of that community um, really would represent many that have been overlooked and underserved in this city for many, many years and still to this day. I've gone on to raise a family here. I've built a career. The majority of my career was spent working in very large, complex global organizations. And so through that experience, I really um, had the ability to learn how to deliver results within complex organizations. Now in 2015, I decided to leave private industry and focus my time here helping to move our city forward. I had had the opportunity to work and lead teams in countries all around the world. And I saw some pretty incredible cities that have things that I wanted for our city. So I spent the last four years working for Edmonton Economic Development Corporation, really focusing on honing the way that we do economic development here in our city so that the businesses that are being built could be successful here. That opportunity uh, really gave me the chance to work day to day with our current mayor, council, and administration at a really deep level. And it was through that experience that I realized that 
part of the issue was the leadership at that table continuing to make promises and not deliver on commitments made to Edmontonians. And then we continued to, it seemed, take one step backwards instead of five steps forward. And that's what this city needs. And so with that view in mind and my commitment to give back to my city had me running, uh, stepping forward and running for mayor with the vision of building a city that works for all Edmontonians. And I think that's exactly what we're going to talk about today is really how do we bring a commitment to user experience, to having deep user empathy and the services that are being created deliver against promises that are going to make improvements. Promises and results is what we need here today, because many of these issues that we're talking about have been talked about for too long. It is time to make change. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, everybody, for the introduction. And now I'll pass it over to Sam for the question and answer period of the, um, of the forum today. All right. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so we had asked the registrants to provide us some questions um, as they registered. So we have a few uh, recurring themes that we've seen, um, accessible and affordable housing, poverty reduction, and accessible and affordable transportation were three uh, quite large ones. Of course, there's many, many more, um, but we will, given our short period of time, focus on these for now um, and hopefully have some time to take some audience questions as well. Um, so as you can see, many people here today express there are gaps in affordable housing, whether that be the disconnect of income from age and rental prices, or there are very few places that are accessible and affordable. We would like to know how you candidates um, would incorporate accessibility and afford affordability for persons with disabilities into Edmonton's broader housing strategy. And we will continue to go in the same order that we uh, did our introduction. So we will start with you, Mr. Conlon. Well, I see a crisis. Uh, functionality is, is Edmonton's crisis. We have followed a uh, misplaced ideology from a federal perspective. We must be careful in this next election uh, that we be sure to put people in place that understand uh, functionality. So the irony is today we're talking about functionality, people with disabilities, and how we can afford put a plan together that is affordable for, uh, for people with disabilities. And it's a challenging, uh, it's a challenging uh, venture to do that because we're in, uh, Edmonton is in crisis mode. And crisis mode is uh, business failure, crime, homelessness, suicide, substance abuse have all led us down a, a different road. And how do, we, how do we solve these issues in order to stabilize our economies? That, that's first and foremost. But once we get our economy back on track, uh, we can look at, at stabilizing and looking to the future for uh, affordable, affordable housing. One thing I'm against is uh, the Blatchford community and walkable communities will not create enough uh, tax revenues in our community to support the municipality. And we need to be sure that we identify the issues. And one of the issues is, is taxation and tax revenue. Of course, we've just come, uh, we're talking about how federal, federal policy has spent uh, and overspent and how that's affected uh, the mayor and our current city council. But we must get back on track in order to afford uh, affordable housing and to look after people with disabilities and how we how we put the city forward. It, this is a complex issue. It's not an easy answer. You might hear some uh, simple solutions today. It's not simple. But number one is our economy must be stabilized. We must look to, uh, to create affordable housing and it's possible to do that. Thanks again for having me. I'd like to say one more thing. Thanks to the doctors, nurses, support staff, the emergency staff and frontline workers for doing a wonderful job and heading into uh, another wave of COVID, uh, we, we couldn't be uh, more grateful to all their hard work. Thanks again. Thank you, Rick. 
and we will move next into Ryan, uh, again, speaking about accessible and affordable housing. You're on mute. Thank you very much. I think like the key to uh, affordable housing is to raise taxes, uh, like the, the, the um, and not, not just our municipal taxes, but the federal and provincial taxes like they've, uh, and, and we can only speak up about that, like city council cannot uh, force the, the provincial or the federal government to, to con uh, discontinue this race to the bottom for, uh, for uh, taxing, uh, especially the rich. But uh, the only reason we don't have affordable housing is because we don't have the revenue to build it. And uh, so I'm gonna speak up against that. And I'm a little annoyed uh, with some of the other candidates. Like we have uh, like people with business backgrounds and they're lobbying to have their own taxes lowered. And I, I just, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel good to me. Like I think that I wanna see a, an economy in our city that's based on on high wages and high taxes like they have in Northern Europe where, and where people are, are taken care of better than they are here. So um, I, I'm, I'm different than the, the rest of the candidates. I think that in Canada, in the province and in the city, we need to raise taxes, especially on the rich. And then we can build the kind of services that we need to have a caring economy instead of a mean, cruel economy that's based on low taxes and cheap labor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Greg. Uh, we will move to um, Kim. You're also on mute. Thank you. You know, all Edmontonians need to have a home and see a future in our city. Uh, and housing, of course, is a key factor here because it's a basic need. Uh, when I was on city council, uh, we were certainly moving in the direction of providing a bunch of different affordable types of housing, uh, accessibility being one of them. Um, and we, of course, had a have a disability advisory committee at the city that gave us a lot of input in terms of how we can improve in terms of accessibility. Um, and we need to acknowledge that the needs of our disability community are varied and ensure the supports and services that we do provide are getting the right outcomes. So I certainly think that we need to do more in terms of consultation uh, and listening to the disability community. But I do recognize that we are in some challenging times in Edmonton. Um, obviously, we need to get through this pandemic. Uh, and going forward, housing will continue to be a major issue. And while I do think that the city has uh, made significant gains in terms of affordable housing, uh, I do feel that there is more that we can do and, and more in particular in terms of accessibility. I think that um, one of the things we need to do is implement a standing monthly community roundtables so that I can hear from community organizations like the Alberta Ability Network and Voice of Albertans with Disabilities um, and hear what's happening on the, on the ground floor in terms of how much progress we're making. Certainly, um, affordable housing has been applying for the city of Edmonton in the past since I was started on council. Um, and there is a number of different affordable housing projects that we are currently building. Uh, I am concerned, however, that we're not building the type of housing that we need and that we've been treating uh, those in the disability community, also those who are vulnerable, uh, as a homogeneous group when in fact the needs are varied. And I think that we need to look at the outcomes in terms of what has been successful in the housing that we're building and continue to build. Um, but I also think that we need to look at alternatives. I mean, we need to look at different ways where we collaborate with agencies and focus on making sure that when we are funding that we're getting the outcomes and the opportunities that Edmontonians expect in terms of housing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim. Uh, and next we have Michael Osher Oshry. Well, thank you very much for the question. Um, we all know, I think, that this is a very um, complex issue. You know, housing is is complex. You've got, you know, affordable housing money. You've got levels of government. You've got private sector. You know, uh, it's a very complex issue. The strategy, I believe, is 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 uh, is fourfold. So, first of all, we have to consider that Edmonton 
is um, we have a huge advantage in Edmonton over other cities in Canada in the sense that for most people, and not everybody, but for most people, we have the most affordable housing stock in the city. So that's a very uh, large advantage for the city. It's a, it, it's a great thing to, to have here. I do understand though that there are many people and I do know that many people in the uh, disabled community that have a hard time with housing. Uh, I do know that the disabled community on average has a lower um, standard of living, lower income than, than average. And so that does affect the amount that they can pay for housing. Um, so, you know, we do have to do something. That is one of the roles of, of government. So we have to make sure that people from the disabled community um, are able to stay in their, in their communities. We have to ensure that there's, a, you know, the, that there's sufficient, um, I know there's building codes, but that we have to honor those building codes and, and, and also help with modifications when, when needed. And then we have to subsidize it when needed. And so the city does have a role. I know the province has a role and I always wanna make sure that the city stays in our lane and, and we hold the province accountable. But for all of those sorts of things, there are some things that the city needs to do and do better um, and uh, you know, stay in our lane, but still, but still support people that, that need it. Um, so thank you very much. Those are my comments on this issue. Thank you very much. Uh, and we will go next to Amarjeet Sohis. I have uh, the opportunity to engage with uh, my friends from the disability community uh, uh, leading up to today and had a, had a session with them. And we have few planned uh, over the next few weeks. Housing has come up all the time <clears throat> and, and accessible housing. So what we are proposing to do is uh, that we have a lot of uh, a commercial vacancy uh, in, in Edmonton, and we should be looking for converting some of those uh, vacant buildings to, uh, uh, to, uh, to affordable suites. Calgary is doing that right now. And as we convert them, uh, we can also retrofit them for higher energy efficiency standards to reduce uh, emissions. We also can make them accessible. Universal design has to be applied to all the buildings that uh, that we are building or uh, retrofitting. I think we should also be working with nonprofit sector, with the uh, co-op co -op housing, with the churches, with nonprofit institutions to uh, use. Uh, sometimes they have large uh, tracts of land that are available. How do we work with them? And we also need to build a stronger advocacy that uh, provincial and federal governments are investing in affordable housing uh, for all Edmontonians, including uh, people with uh, disabilities. I believe that housing is a right. It is not an optional thing. Everyone should have a safe, accessible, and affordable place to call home. And when I was a federal minister, I worked really closely with my counterparts uh, in the different ministries to create a national accessibility legislation that puts the standards in, standards in place for, uh, so that people with disabilities have equal access to programs and services, including housing. Thank you very much. Uh, next we have Diana Steele. I agree with the comments here. Um, housing is not optional. We all do deserve a home, absolutely. And we can see that affordable housing is needed more than ever before. The pandemic has certainly shined a light on that. I know that the city is working on um, moving this forward and I intend to continue that work as well. I did meet with a woman a couple of weeks ago who explained to me that there are minimal costs that can be done um, in regards to making homes uh, accessible to those who require them and uh, the cost implications are, are small and yet not they're not being done by builders so perhaps we need to look at some policy change there um, but I do have lots of friends in this community who keep me up to date regularly and I am definitely an advocate so I will do everything in my power to ensure that your voices are heard and represented, represented as well. Thank you very much, Diana. Uh, and finally, we have Cheryl Watson. We need to take more accountability for this issue. And I am frustrated that we continue to talk about things that should just be basic needs and basic design principles. So first, what I'll say about accessibility, I've heard from a number of the other speakers around how we brought in um, advisory groups and steering committees, and, and that's really not gonna drive action. 
if we have more of a focus on the users of, of the homes or the users of the service more actually involved in testing, in user design, we're gonna have better outcomes immediately. And so this isn't about having someone check in and mark work that's already completed. It's more like about having them immediately involved in the design process. The second thing I'll say is that we know that this is a, a complex issue and it does involve other orders of government, private industry, nonprofits in this city as well. And so we need a mayor that is able to effectively collaborate with all of these partners, bring people to the table, have them committed to co-investing. One of the things that the city has no shortage of is land. And so the city does have the ability to gift land um, that can be used to build this affordable housing. And it's time that we release some of these land assets so that they can be used and located. These, the housing can be located in the communities where it's needed most. Thank you very much. Um, so we will move to our next question. Um, and it's been kind of mentioned already in the responses from the candidates is that we know that people with disabilities are more likely to live in poverty than those who are not disabled. Uh, so in sort of the same vein, how will the candidates work to alleviate poverty specifically for persons with disabilities? Oh yes, sorry, starting with you. Uh, sorry, you're muted again. Can you hear me now? Economic stability is a, is a key component to uh, stabilizing our environment. And without, uh, without a focus on, uh, one thing I totally disagree with is, is uh, the Mayor Don Iveson has adopted the federal policy and it's put uh, Edmontonians in harm's way. So when we see so much crime, but we see homelessness and substance abuse and people with disabilities. We are vulnerable as a as a community right now, and we're we're actually we're in distress, enormous distress. And if we do not alter that path, what do we do to make that better? We 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 need to stabilize our economies in order to have the resources necessary to, uh, to look after uh, people with disabilities and the homeless. It, it is critical. And I, I can't state enough that we must alter our path that perpetuates these issues. That's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you very much. And next we have Brian Gregg, Breezy Gregg. Hi, right, thank you, Sam. Could you repeat the question for me, please? Yes. Uh, how will you work to alleviate poverty specifically for persons with disabilities? All right. Uh, in general, I, I want to, to work to uh, eliminate poverty by uh, uh, providing the basic services for, for people. There's four basic services. Uh, housing, which we've been talking about, shelter, uh, food, uh, medical care, and education, and uh, I, I this is a long range plan that I want this to, to try to set up. Uh, I, I'm willing to serve for one term if I'm if I'm uh, uh, fortunate enough to become mayor. But I'm going to push us to, to have a long range plan to build a 15 minute uh, neighborhoods that include those four services, social services. I, I, I want to see every community, including Valley View and Rio Terrace. Uh, with a homeless shelter in it, a small homeless shelter. I, I don't like this not in my backyard thing. I think the only fair thing to do is to have services in every single community. Right now we have a community hall in each community where only rich people can rent it and go have a party. Uh, we need uh, services for, uh, for, for, the, for people with disabilities and for pe people who are poor in every community. We need to have a soup kitchen. We need to, and we don't need these to be run by charities. We need this to be like a pub, a public social services, uh, a soup kitchen, a library, uh, a shelter, uh, and 
and uh, a clinic with uh, with staff there. That's my long range plan that I want to see for our city. I want to be able to people to be able to access all those services. Um, it's it's a big plan, and of course, like coming back to it, it means that we have to raise taxes to have that kind of a service in our society. But I believe that's the kind of society that most people want. We want a society where we care about everybody, we look after each other. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and next we have Kim Purcell. Thank you. You know, with the pandemic, I think that the isolation and the challenges that are facing people with disabilities has really been extremely challenging for, for folks. Um, I do have some personal experience um, with in my own family with people struggling with disabilities. Uh, my aunt would love to work but uh, she was hit by a drunk driver and she is physically disabled to the point where she can't. So she has to rely on a combination of government services. Uh, and I understand how important those are. And my cousin is autistic, uh, but he is highly functioning. So one of the good things that I learned uh, in, in, and also when I'm my time back in council, when I was listening to the committee that we had that would advise us on council about disabilities, is that jobs and opportunity are really important for everyone. And in particular, for those who have disabilities. So for those who can't work, obviously uh, we need supports and where the city can, uh, we need to continue to do so. But uh, we need to push the province in terms of making sure that people have enough money who are facing disabilities and challenged that they can, they can make ends meet. Uh, in terms of helping in jobs and opportunity for those who can work, I think we need to work with our not-for-profit community, um, groups like C5 who are already working on trying to provide jobs, but we also need to work with some of our social enterprise groups like Goodwill that actually does a great job of training and providing jobs and opportunity. And we can work with the private sector and talk about the different jobs and opportunity. And the city itself can be an employer for those who are faced with disabilities and are looking for opportunity and jobs. So I think that's one of the most critical things we can look at doing to address poverty issues. Um, obviously, we do have in the city government supports in terms of different ways that we try to help, but we are limited in terms of direct dollars in comparison to what the province can do and the feds can do. And so I think it's important for us to work on poverty reduction where we can and the city from what I can see since I've been gone has been doing quite a bit of work in this area, but I'm not sure if action has necessarily resulted. And I think that going forward as we get through the pandemic and hopefully move forward with economic recovery, that we look at different ways to provide jobs and opportunity for people and ensure that they do have supports that they need. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Uh, Michael Elfrey. Yeah, well, thank you for the question. You know, one of the four themes of, of our campaign is Edmonton for everyone. And we want to make sure that everybody has uh, successes, including including economic successes and make sure that people are uh, obviously aren't living uh, at poverty or near poverty. And we have to make sure that people have the same opportunities as much as possible. And as I mentioned earlier in my comments, I do understand that, uh, you know, people with disabilities um, sometimes have lower incomes and lower standard of, of livings. And so we have to have to do something about that. You know, um, when I talk to people in the, in the community, in the disability, uh, disabled community, um, you know, especially around the city's role. And, you know, I know that the city has employment services and other things like that. And, um, you know, people that I talk to are not happy with, with the quality of those services. And so those are the types of things that the city needs to step up and do a better job with. Um, as far as um, some other things that we're talking about, you know, we're talking about some programs that are going to help uh, everybody who's living at or near poverty. So, for example, our after school free play plan that we're going to open up the city rec centers for all kids under 18 um, for free, um, which also doubles then as child care for some families that may need it after school. And so there's some programs like that that help um, people that are living at or near the poverty line. Um, and so I think the city has to step up with programs similar to that. And then the last thing I'll say is, you know, I, I'll talk about tax rates. You know, we're, we're, we've, we've had a city that's had um, tax rates that have property tax rates that have been above inflation and above, above the cost of living um, for 15 years plus. 
And, you know, given the economic realities now, we're, we're going to have to make some hard, tough decisions. Uh, it's very easy to say we're going to do all these things for everybody and pay for everything for everybody. But the fact of the matter is, you know, we're not going to have the resources and we're going to have to be really careful and put our money to work where it's uh, where it can make the most impact. And those types of property taxes, by the way, um, really doesn't uh, affect people living in their homes or renting. You know, it, it really does increase the rent. It really does increase the cost of, of living at home and people that are are uh, you know having a hard time making ends meet or or just get by every month? Those kind of things really make a huge difference, and um, you know so we can't do every you know we just we just won't have the resources. So we're going to have to make some some tough choices. And so um, you know given all that, I think we can really do a good job. Pick pick certain things that we need to do that are going to make big impacts, and then uh, unfortunately not do some things that we're just not going to be able to afford. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and Amarjeet Sohi. Well, thank you for this question. I I have lived in near poverty conditions, uh, so I know the anxieties uh, uh, that people go through when they don't have enough to make ends meet. I think there's a lot of levers at the disposal of city to tackle poverty, and some of these are economic, attracting uh, investment in our city to create jobs investing in social and value-based procurement so that uh, small businesses and uh, people, people, people with disability to who own business have access to city procurement, uh, reducing red tape for small business so that doing business in Edmonton is easy, convenient, and affordable. But I also believe that addressing poverty is more than just creating jobs those jobs must be meaningful jobs for people with disabilities as well. It is about ensuring that people have access to public services that improve our quality of life, like public transit, libraries, parks, recreational centers. And it's about creating housing options that we talked about uh, uh, earlier. You know, poverty is also connected to racism. Poverty is also connected to historical trauma that indigenous communities are facing. Poverty is also connected to addiction that so many Edmontonians are facing. So we need to work together on these intersecting issues that cause, cause poverty. Uh, a child care is a great example that can help lift people out of poverty and get uh, more women back into the, uh, into the workforce. So if I am elected, I would create an Edmonton child care strategy to create more child care spaces, amend our zoning bylaws to expand child care opportunities and integrate our current services like libraries and rec centers into child care, among many other things. I am deeply committed to this. I applaud the work of uh, at, and, uh, the organization called End Poverty Edmonton. They have done phenomenal work over the last number of years, and we're going to build on their strengths. In, I believe that all Edmontonians, Edmonton should uh, be for all of us and no Edmontonian should live in poverty. Thank you. Uh, and Diana Steele? We will act as a champion for change by providing public awareness of local issues. The more we know, the more we can help and offer resources for engagement of individuals living in poverty as well. I will also actively work with all levels of government to ensure that their needs are being met. And some examples of how we might be able to help municipally are things like transit passes or uh, making the completion of DAX forms a little less cumbersome. I have been told, and I'm not sure if this is completely correct, that uh, there are 33 forms and they're $10 per form uh, for a doctor to fill out and they are required to have a physician fill them out, which is uh, unaffordable for someone who is facing poverty. Um, we also need to, as we talked about, ensure that we have affordable housing that meets the needs of the disabled community. And we talked about making sure that there might be some policy change uh, in regards to the new build specifications that are inexpensive but necessary. And working with community leagues, that's my background. I know what we're capable of doing. We should have community supports and programs run out of community leagues because they're close to home for you and they're easily accessible. That's it. Thank you very much. And last but not least, Cheryl Watson. 
This is such an important topic. Nearly 35% of Edmontonians have income levels below 30,000, and that number is just continuing to grow. And we know that COVID has had a major impact as well. And so there's just really so many people that are either living in poverty or teetering on the edge of poverty. And we also know that among that demographic, the majority of them are newcomers to this city and or those with disabilities. And so it's, it's a critical need that we have to make sure that the city services that are being delivered to that population serve their needs. A number of months ago, we announced a basic needs policy and it was focused specifically on that. What can the city do within its means and mandate to help create better lives day to day? Some of the things in the policy seem so obvious, but we're lacking access to drinking water, access to public washrooms. And I'll also build on the role that I think community leagues have in playing. And so great, uh, great point that Diana brought up is our community leagues are in our neighborhoods and they are the closest to the residents that need support and services. And so how do we really support um, making sure that community leagues have what they need? <clears throat> one of the things that we talked about in the basic needs policy for one example, is community gardens. If you've been driving around or walking around some of your communities, you're seeing more and more of these community gardens. But the city of Edmonton makes it really, really hard for the community leagues to put in these uh, gardens. There's a lot of red tape. And so if we are looking at community leagues to play a larger role supporting our Edmontonians that have the greatest needs. We need to make sure that we're enabling them and helping them to provide those services right in communities. Thank you very much. And so we will go into our last kind of prepared question, which should leave us with a bit of time. We have lots of questions in the Q&A. Uh, candidates, please feel free to answer those if you would like to, um, either in the chat or right in the Q&A box. Um, so our last one, however, uh, that's prepared is there are many challenges in transportation. There's restrictive scheduling, changes in services, affordability and access are all things that come to mind. How would you manage Edmonton's transit system and policies to address the transportation challenges faced by persons with disabilities? And we, again, we'll start with uh, Rick Comrie. Uh, it's interesting, I met with a senior uh, yesterday and her concern was uh, busing. And she has a petition of close to 200 names uh, from her senior's apartment in West Edmonton. She reached out to her city councilor and unfortunately the city councilor hasn't responded. And I think transparency and integrity in government is very, very important. But now we have seniors and people with disability where busing is, is inefficient. And according to this nice lady whose petition has close to 200 names, uh, the busing and demand isn't sufficient. So at the core of the issue is uh, federal policy is pushing upon us an ideology and a way of life that we cannot afford. Uh, people with disability, our seniors, our veterans, these people are, are in harm's way because of policy. And LRT is misplaced. And at the core of the issue is massive spending on LRT that's being subsidized by the taxpayer is putting at risk other modes of transportation. And now we talk about people with disabilities. My goodness, if we do not alter our path that perpetuates these issues, we must, we must stop spending unnecessarily. And at the core, economic stability is what provides the monies necessary for people with disabilities at the core. And we must find a way to solve these issues. One of my platform's issues is a plebiscite on LRT and spending. I'm an opponent of the LRT. I'm not an opponent of rapid transit. But the, the misplaced LRT is causing massive hardship to people with disabilities, to seniors, to our veterans. It is causing dysfunction in its enormous 
the taxation dollars that are being spent that could be used to help people with disabilities, the homeless, the substance abuse. I've said enough, thanks so much. I'm gonna exit the meeting. I've got another meeting I've gotta be in. I'd like to say thank you to the people with disabilities and everyone who's uh, participating in this very, very important meeting. And it's been a pleasure for me to be here. And um, as a mayor of Canada, I couldn't be more honored. Have a great day. And thanks for being you. Thank you, Rick Henry. Have a good day. Um, next, we will go to Brian Gregg. Okay, Sam, what's the question again, please? Uh, how would you manage Edmonton's transit system and policies to address the transportation challenges faced by persons with disabilities? Well, uh, I think that we should have like an on-demand system for people with disabilities so that, th that they should just be able to call, like they could call a cab and, and, and get the proper kind of uh, assistance, even if they need a person to help them or whatever. But th that's one, one piece of it. But the other piece is uh, a back again to the 15 minute neighborhood. If, if we have the services that disabled people need close in their neighborhood, they're not gonna have to travel very far. So this is gonna like save money and save burning up fossil fuel because uh, if we don't have to travel, people don't realize how much traffic we have in our city. Like I go uh, every day and try to do a street concert. I'll go to a bit busy intersection and like 12,000 cars will go by me in an hour. Like that's a lot of burning. And where are all those people going? We need, to, we need to design our city so that we don't have to travel such vast distances to work. We should try to find work close to home and all the services, and especially for the disabled, we need, a, we need a, a, an on-demand system where they can just call or text or whatever and get, and get assistance to go where they need to go. But we have to design it so we don't have to go all the way across the city to get our services, they have to, it has to be close. It's efficient. It's a way for us to to deal with the climate emergency and to burn less, and it's a, a way to be more compassionate toward the people who who don't can't afford the expensive ways of traveling. Uh, uh, just a comment I'd like to, to say about the LRTs. Uh, I've gone and checked out. I used to uh, busk in the LRT, and there'd be like hundreds and hundreds of people going by me at rush hour, I've gone down a few times recently, like I'd say the ridership's at about 3%. So we're right now it's it's not any, the city's fault, but it, it's the pandemic's fault, but we are running these big trains uh, with hardly any people on them. It's like, woo, you know, uh, I, I'm not sure in the future, in the long run, if we're going to have this kind of mass transit, I think it's going to all uh, evolve into uh, uh, autonomous vehicles. And they'll be they'll be much more organized and much more fuel efficient, but the the big efficiency I see is having the fifteen minute neighborhood, uh, not only for uh, people with disabilities but for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Brian uh, and Kim Krishel. I thank you. You know, it's interesting. The number one issue, <clears throat> excuse me, that I've heard from people with disabilities, but also seniors and all kinds of people is the challenge that they're having with dots. And I, I'm frustrated to hear all of the complaints because certainly we, when I was on the city, we, we did work very hard to improve the system and fast forward to today, eight years later, and I'm hearing that it's even more challenging than it was in the past. Um, Particularly for with the pandemic, I recognize that that has increased the challenges that uh, people are facing uh, in terms of getting on DATS on time. But the fact is, is our DATS system isn't working. We're not uh, picking people up on time to the point where they get so frustrated that they don't actually make the appointments that they need. Or, you know, they do take a cab, but then again, that, that cuts into their bottom line of how much money they have. So one of the things we need to look at with DATS, and we have actually this technology in Edmonton right now being used in, in the school bus transportation area, is to do a much better job in terms of customer service and actually making sure that we can monitor in real time the pickups for people and making sure that they get to their appointments on time. So that's one thing that needs to change. I, 
certainly the other issue for folks is access to the system. We do have uh, bus fares, but I, I do appreciate the fact that there are concerns around those who need to be able to access more of a DATS type of system. And so one of the things I think we need to look at is what we can do uh, more effectively in terms of utilizing our new on-demand service to provide more pick up with um, organizations, especially for seniors, so that they're able to get around more effectively. Um, you know, I was chair of Donator Ride when I was on city council, and that gave me a real appreciation for just how challenging it is and how much gap there is. Now we raised money, it's the only city council created charity where we actually raised dollars that we would then uh, provide transit tickets to a number of agencies. And I would want to see that program continue, but also, you know, the city has taken on a new program called PATH, and I have heard positive uh, stories that PATH is making a difference for quite a few people who uh, are challenged in terms of being able to access the transit system, and that the more that they get access to transit passes, the more they can get, for example, to their jobs, to a doctor's appointment. So. We're not doing great and we need to look at that. In terms of our overall transportation network, I'm definitely getting complaints and frustrated to hear about how we seem to have gaps, but I think what we need to do is this on-demand system is brand new. We're gonna need to see where, whether we can tweak it and make it better rather than do a complete overhaul or whether we are in a situation where we have to do an overhaul. Um, I did recently work with the city. I found that there was an area in Edmonton where a number of elderly Sikh seniors were in a very um, difficult situation where their bus had been canceled. So they were having to walk quite a distance when brand new area and weren't able to get effectively to their location. So I did work with the city and we actually managed to get uh, bus 78 reinstated. And I think we need to do more of reviewing and making sure that people have access, but definitely DATS has to improve and we need more customer service. Thank you, Kim. Um, Michael. Yeah, you know, thank you for the question. This is a, a big issue for many people around the city. You know, I, I also have met with groups of seniors and people um, in the disabled community, and this is, this is, you know, I might argue this is the most important one. Um, um, there are all three of these issues are important, but this, this is one that gets mentioned quite a lot. You know, the new bus system is, is, is come out to mixed reviews and um, it's typically mixed reviews for people that can, that have, that don't have mobility issues. So people have to walk a little further, but they, you know, get more frequent buses and that sort of thing. It, it seems to be a positive, but, but then people that have mobility issues, it's obviously a negative because of that distance. And so uh, I think we do have to review it. Um, as far as <clears throat> DATS goes, you know, uh, I've, I've also heard mixed, mixed reviews. Um, obviously, it's a good service when it works, but like anything else, when it doesn't work, it's, it's, it's uh, more than unfortunate. It does affect people's daily lives, so we do have to look at that. Uh, I'm, in, I'm in discussions with a, a private sector group who is looking to do something in this, in this space by providing um, transportation opt, uh, different sort of uh, transportation options uh, for people in the disabled community. And so uh, I've got some discussions scheduled next week, actually, with them, and I think they're going to step up and do something. So we have more of that uh, later. As far as um, besides besides uh, uh, public transportation, you know, we we have to make sure that people can get around if they're in wheelchairs. One of the one of the you know, I know it's not transportation like we've been talking about, but it is an issue for for the disabled community. And there is there are still many areas of the city that does not have uh, wheelchair accessible, um, um, you know, curb cuts and the like, and then buildings that people with wheelchairs I know can't get into that are more in the private sector than the public sector that we have to uh, do some work as a city to get the private sector to make all of their uh, commercial buildings uh, wheelchair accessible. And then we have to finally, um, I'll add, enforce the, the disabled sticker uh, challenges, you know, with more people aging, uh, our, our, our uh, seniors are becoming more, there's people with with disabilities, as we all know, and there's not a lot of enforcement when it comes to that. And so we have to make sure that the city steps up and, and, and does their bylaw enforcement, which has been lacking as well. So when you put those all together, I think we've got a pretty good plan of, of how we're gonna attack this issue. Um, and I uh, look forward to hearing more about it from the community. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. And Amarjeet Sohi. Well, many of the people who are listening to this conversation would know that I worked at DATS and at ETS for 17 years. So I know how important public transit is. It is not just about getting from one place to another. Public transportation is a vehicle for social mobility because it provides you access to good jobs. It provides you access to community, to, uh, uh, to education. And uh, I advocated very strongly for uh, improving public transit when I was a city councilor uh, throughout the city. Uh, I am deeply disappointed uh, that this current city council has eliminated uh, access to public transit for many people with disabilities, uh, many racialized communities that Kemu was talking about. And uh, you now I'm glad that we were able to work with ETS to restore uh, that access to the Gurdwara in, uh, uh, in, in Millwoods. Uh, and a uh, reduction in public transit is impacting more uh, for people with disabilities and women and, uh, and racialized and marginalized communities. I'm gonna work hard with council to restore that service back to the standards that have existed uh, uh, before because I believe that access to public transit uh, is critical for people for their for them to build their capacity to participate in the uh, uh, in the uh, in the community public transit should also be accessible uh, i'm glad that we have uh, all accessible vehicles now and uh, our buses are accessible public transit should also be affordable uh, we have seniors pass we have uh, you know students pass the u pass that have worked really really hard to make sure it happened for students and we need to continue to make sure that accessibility and affordability remains part of the conversations for people with disabilities and access to public transit is absolutely, absolutely critical for me. And I look forward to working with people with disabilities and their organizations to improve that service uh, if I'm given the honor to uh, lead our city. Thank you very much. And Diana Steele. I feel quite passionately about this uh, subject because it is something I'm contacted about regularly. So the transit system and DAPS as well. Our transit system is currently experiencing a number of challenges for our users and it's unacceptable to me in regards to how it's affecting their quality of life. Um, I'm a big fan of creating advocacy groups, so those who use our services are the ones who should have the, the biggest say in how they are developed. And I don't know the answer right now. Um, like Kim said, I don't know if we need to go back and rebuild everything or if we have to revert back to a previous system. I'm not sure what it looks like yet. I need to sit in the... Uh, in that seat and, and make those decisions after consulting with people and looking at what's going on. But uh, I can rest assured, and let you know that it is definitely on my radar right now. Thank you. And Cheryl Watson. We're all talking about the same issues here and we're all aware of the problems that have been going on for years. I think that this is really about prioritization and commitment. So it's about a leader's need to focus or ability to focus on what's really wrong and who is the population right now that is suffering. Uh, we know that DATS has been a problem for years. I sat in a city council meeting around two years ago for an entire day where I heard the most painful stories. They nothing's been fixed. Now we have the new bus service that has actually exacerbated the issue. And it's not just the uh, disabled community that's affected, we have the seniors community that's affected. So seniors that used to take the bus are now then overburdening the DAT system that already was not serving those in need. So again, I think this comes back to leadership. We need a leader that has the courage and conviction to make change in these areas and not just ignore them for years and years and years. We have people right now in the city that cannot leave their homes because the service is not there for them to be able to do that. This is unacceptable. So here's what I would challenge is think about a leader that's going to be able to make change, that has the ability to drive change, 
and that will not stand by and allow a huge population of their citizen group, those that have the highest needs, continue to struggle in the way that they have been. Thank you very much to all the candidates for preparing, um, for I mean, responding to those questions. Uh, before we get to the chat, I just had one more that came from our registrations. Um, and I think the best way to do this with our limited time is to just uh, allow candidates to offer to speak to these questions. Um, so the one that came from our registrations was, how will the candidates address disabilities in the newcomer sector? How will candidates help address the stigma and shame many feel to make Edmonton a more equitable place to live? And so I'll just open that up. I don't know if you want to raise your hands or just unmute. Sure, Michael, is that a hand? Absolutely. Michael Osher. So thank you. You know, um, Edmonton is a very, very diverse city now. It wasn't the case 20 or 30 years ago. Um, you know, half of the population in Edmonton is now not, as an example, is not Christian. Uh, many, uh, obviously, there's visible minorities, there's, uh, there's you know, there, there, there's people of all faiths, all cultural backgrounds, um, all genders, all, I mean, there's just a ton of diversity here. And we have to ensure that everybody, no matter who they are, where they're from, what their background is, has the same and equal opportunity to succeed here. Um, and it's not, I, I do know it's not happening. You know, I've talked to lots of people from different communities and, uh, um, you know, they're not feeling like they're getting a fair shake. And so we have to make sure as part of our role of government that, that everybody has a, a chance to succeed. And then government does have a role to ensure that in all, um, you know, uh, in, the, in the employees of the government, there's over 10,000 employees in the city of Edmonton, um, at all the boards and commissions, you know, every, there's representation of, of all types of people, I'll say. Um, and so that, that comes down to, you know, opportunities from, from, a work, from a work perspective, from a representation perspective, as I mentioned earlier, from an economic opportunity, from a social opportunity, and we're trying to build an inclusive city here. And so that's really where the government has a role is to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to succeed. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Kim, Kershaw. Thank you. Um, you know, accessibility for newcomers is a big issue. I, and one of the things that I propose from listening to the Filipino community was the fact that when newcomers come, they're not always connected to existing organizations uh, and help. And the Filipino community would like to know when newcomers are coming and have a way to connect. One of the things I find is when you're navigating our city of Edmonton website, it is very challenging to be able to uh, connect and see what's happening in our cultural groups, what's happening in our community leagues, to even understand we have a community league system. And so one of the things I'm calling for is an app that would be right on the city of Edmonton. It would be easy and accessible for everybody. And it would connect newcomers to people from their cultural background, but also other cultural organizations and entities and agencies that actually can help newcomers. So I think that's one of the biggest problems that newcomers are facing. So when they get here, it's overwhelming. The first thing they're learning, of course, is they're, they're dealing with the federal government and getting housing, and then they're dealing with learning English. And the challenge for them in French, and the challenge for them is the fact that uh, they don't know who to connect with. The other issue I've heard from newcomers when it comes to equitability, and being equal is that they don't have the same opportunities for jobs, uh, that they don't have the same opportunity to get on boards. And so one of the things I'm calling for is when it comes to boards, we need to make it easier for people to be considered for some of the boards and civic agencies that our city council appoints people to. And how do we do that? Well, first of all, we make it so that everyone's on the same level playing field. And that means providing a type of course that would be easy to take, that would teach people about rules um, and how you handle Robert's rules, how you do board governance, what's involved. Because today, a lot of people get on boards because they have special qualifications such as ICD. And so this is one of the things that I think can help us. And the other is, is to work with our cultural organizations in terms of crossing our cultures over and working with the business community much more effectively than we have in the past and working towards providing more jobs and opportunity for newcomers. So those are some of the ideas that I have if you check out my platform at crucialformayor.com. Thanks. Thank you, and Cheryl? 
Community leagues are key. This is a really unique differentiator that we have in our city is that we have these incredible community leagues, but we're really not using them to their full potential. And so if you think about neighborhoods and relationships that you have with the people in your community, how wonderful would it be if uh, a newcomer to this city, someone actually knocked on their door and introduced themselves to them as another member of the community and really help to have a more personal um, engagement and a personal welcome to our city. And so that's my recommendation really is how do we supercharge and empower and enable our community leagues to better represent and introduce and welcome and integrate uh, newcomers into, into the city. Thank you, and Diana. I just wanted to add, I agree with everything that every other candidate has mentioned here as well. Um, it is critical that newcomers feel welcome in our city. And I just wanted to reinforce that my leadership style is as a servant leader, which means that it's about giving a voice to all Edmontonians through me. And that's it. Thank you. So we do have uh, about five. I had a quite. I oh, sorry, I did get sure. a chance. To, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Uh, you know, I was once a newcomer uh, to Edmonton, and the biggest factor for uh, uh, in my success as a newcomer was access to high quality public services like uh, education, uh, uh, public transit, libraries, parks, recreation centers, and the arts. And access to these services. Uh, helped me to learn English, make friends, uh, connect with the community and live a healthy life. And even when I did not have many resources. So that is why I believe that we must invest in the public services now more than ever. And we should not be reducing our public services and we should not be privatizing our public services to uh, uh, make them uh, a less quality uh, and these services are critical for newcomers and no matter their ability but also for our city's residents who have faced a, a challenging time over the last uh, last 18 18 months so i believe that uh, newcomers should have access to quality high quality public services like all the other edmontonians and we need to make them affordable uh, for all edmontonians including newcomers Thank you all. Uh, so we will add, uh, I'll answer one of these questions. I just mentioned in the chat, I will capture all of our questions and answers and that are both in the chat and the Q&A box and send them to the candidates so they can have the opportunity to respond. And I will send that out to all our registrants after we give an appropriate chance to ask these or answer these complex questions. Um, I will ask just one more, which is the first one we got. And it's kind of broad and I think a good way to end. Um, People with disabilities, or I guess I'll read it. Uh, it's a question for all of you. As a disabled man all my life, I've heard promises that end in nothing. What would be your first order of business to the community to make us seen and heard? And I think that's a great um, overarching question on how you include this community in addressing or creating policy. I don't know if we want to go in order again or if people just want to put their hands up. Mr. Sonia. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, we got to continue to listen to the community. I engaged with uh, uh, people from uh, disability communities. I would love to engage with uh, your organization as well. I always consult with a very close friend of mine who's a, a community activist and he has lived uh, uh, all his life with a disability, Zach, uh, Zachary Weeks. Uh, who is a phenomenal, phenomenal individual. And he has been an advocate on behalf of the disability communities. We need to create a structure that we continue to engage so that people are being heard, people are being seen, and people are being listened to. Zachary actually challenged me to spend a day in a wheelchair when I was a city councilor. And I would encourage every leader to spend a day in a wheelchair navigating their day-to-day -day activities. It opens your eyes to the challenges, the simple things that people with the, the uh, uh, people uh, that with the, don't have any disabilities face are a huge, huge barriers for people with the disabilities. 
the things that you take for granted are not accessible for people with disability. With dis disability. So what do we need to do? Create a structure for ongoing consultation and engagement, and also allow people with disability to sit on every board in the city, not just on the disability board, but every board. There's so much talent out there among all Edmontonians, including with people with disabilities that we are not tapping into because of our uh, nomination process and our appointment process is not open and accessible and is not really looking for the talent from equity seeking communities, including uh, people with disabilities. I wanna change that by empowering people to participate in our de democratic process in every aspect of our city building. Thank you, Kim. Oh, I see Brian, I'll add it to the list. Um, thank you. I think it's a good question. I think that you've, the question has some cynicism and I get that. Um, I think that a lot of politicians promise a lot of things and we all wanna do things. Um, I think the challenge that we're facing is, let's be real, I don't think any platform is gonna prepare us for what we're gonna be dealing with over the next four years as a city council. I think that what I would commit to is being, certainly I believe that you need to walk in people's shoes and have empathy and see what their situation is. Uh, I have a track record of doing that. Yesterday, I walked with the Chinese Business Association and saw some of the challenges. I talked to people who are vulnerable and marginalized, and I also talked to business owners. Um, I have spent time within the disability community in the past, and I have relatives that are challenged with disabilities. And I see how tough it is when uh, you, one, can't make ends meet, and two, that you can't get around, especially in a pandemic. So I think the, my commitment would be to being willing to get out there and figure out solutions to the extent that the city can, that can make a real difference. And I have a track record of doing that. I donate a ride when I first started and chaired that, we didn't actually generate a lot of revenue. By the time I left city council, we were generating quite a bit of revenue with that charity. And we raised a lot of money that provided transit tickets for those who needed it in terms of through the civic agencies. I think that getting out and doing is the answer. Thank you. Okay, we'll do Diana, then Brian, then Cheryl. I need to continue talking to those with the lived experiences. Um, I'm fortunate that my private life is enriched by many individuals from this community. So I know what you're facing and I know what you need and I am here for you. And to quote my friend Brad Barco, who is a tireless advocate in your community and who is joining us here today, it's not about me, it's about we. And it really does take a community. Thank you. Go ahead, Brian. Thanks very much. Well, um, I would, uh, you know, if I'm fortunate enough to be elected as our mayor, I would commit to uh, uh, doing what they do in uh, in Europe when they're looking at, at uh, social problems. And that was would be to form a citizen's assembly and uh, get the city to hire uh, uh, probably like 50% uh, people with disabilities and 50% people that weren't disabled to, to have, have this um, citizens assembly where they would sit down and be paid to meet regularly and and to look at solutions to this problem. So t try to take like, a, a, like they take a random sample, or they try to, just like picking a jury and you get ordinary citizens, disabled and abled to sit down and discuss solutions instead of just leaving it all up to elected officials. Uh, uh, bring the, the public more, get more involved in finding the solutions. So that's what I would commit to uh, as something that, that's proven to be successful in Europe for resolving some of their issues. Thank you. And Cheryl. I am a leader that delivers results and I have a personal accountability ratio that I hold myself to, which is a one-to-one -one say do ratio. So if you're going to say something, you have to deliver on your commitments. And that's something that I'm gonna to continue to bring if I'm elected mayor. 
the first thing that we would do is we would look at all of the recommendations that have been written and created over the years by many of the councils that have been serving for a long time. I talked to my friend Don Cody the other day, and she has sat on the Women's Initiative Board for the City of Edmonton for nearly five years. And I asked her if through all of that time that she has committed, whether anything's actually been done. Has she felt that the needle had been moved by any of the recommendations that they had been made that they had made over the years? And she said no. And so again, I appreciate and understand the cynicism because I would be cynical too when people are giving their time, making recommendations and nothing happens with them. So my commitment would be to go back and look at the recommendations that have been created over the years and implement them. Thank you very much, and Michael. Thank you. <clears throat> I'll just give you a, a brief answer. You know, the, you know, I know about the Disability Advisory Committee and other groups that are advising the elected officials and the bureaucracy about uh, what is needed. Um, and the first thing I would do would be go back to that group and say, you know, give me one thing that you want the city to do. What is the lowest hanging fruit? What is a quick win? What is the one thing that the city needs to do that the city is not doing now? Um, because, you know, as an elected officials or even the senior bureaucrats um, have meetings and sort of have these platform ideas and all these things that we that we think is needed. But at the end of the day, the frontline citizens are the one that know best. And so I would want a quick early win. Um, and I don't know what the answer is, actually. I'll, I'll admit that very well. I, I don't know what would be that one thing yet. But I would go back to the community and say, what's the one quick win that you want that you think the city needs to do right now? And then I would do that. Thank you. Okay, I'll pass it off to Margot to just close us out. Thank you for shining the brightest light on the issues that are facing people with disabilities, not only in this city, but in um, other municipalities in the province. I appreciate the, um, the solution focused uh, responsibilities that the uh, candidates have spoke about. Uh, like Sam said, we did not get to all of the questions, but we will be sending those out to the candidates for a response. And we'll off also be um, putting an overlay of ASL on the YouTube before we mount it. So thank you everyone for joining us today. And we are grateful to everybody who has taken the time out of your very busy schedules to be here with us. We believe Edmonton can be a truly welcoming, inclusive and accessible city for all. And your being here indicates your commitment to Edmontonian. Edmontonians, thank you. And so we will allow if you would like just a click to put, plug your information in case you do want to speak to people one on one. I uh, will allow the candidates again to go in order and just quickly close out. Uh, so Brian, we'll start with you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Brian Breezy Greg. That's how my name's going to appear on the ballot. It's Brian Breezy in brackets and Greg. Uh, my platform is at uh, Brian Greg. That's Greg with two G's at the end. Dot com. And uh, I'm not going to have uh, any. I'm protesting the. Uh, uh, the big money in politics. I'm not having any plastic signs or paper brochures like the other candidates, and I'm not asking for donations. Uh, I believe that it's undemocratic to do so. Thank you very much, everybody, and thank you for having me at, uh, at this forum. I can. Um, first of all, I just want to thank you for hosting this forum and for all the mayoral candidates that are here today. It's not easy to run for office. Uh, if you are interested in learning more about my platform, you can check it out at crucialformayor.com. And I have put out actually probably the most amount of platform of any candidate. But the reason why I'm running and the reason why I encourage you to consider supporting me is because I care and I also care about empowering others to make a difference in the city. And I have a track record of having done a number of things to make our city a better place from creating Edmonton's next gen to helping the city of Edmonton Youth Council address homelessness, the heart to art campaign, to working to improve a transit system. And I feel that right now we need a leader who does have experience and understands the city, but at the same time has business experience and understands the challenges we're facing with this pandemic and can get us to economic growth and have 
an understanding of how to get things done. And that is why I'm running. Thank you. Thank you, Michael Oshry. Well, thank you very much for hosting. Um, my name on the ballot does not have Breezy in the brackets in the middle. It's just my name. Um, <clears throat> so uh, again, thank you everybody for, for, for having me. You know, this is a, a really difficult time for the city and it's really unknown where our successes are gonna come from. And we really need to focus on the economy and then use those funds to support people that need it. And that's really what our campaign is talking about. And my website is just my name, michaeloshry.ca. I put it in the chat, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And so you can go and look at all of the different platform uh, ideas that we have. We've got four themes and under each theme, we've got very specifics of what we're gonna do for uh, in a variety of different areas. And we really have to get the city back uh, back on track uh, out of COVID and manage the, manage the funds and then, uh, you know, leverage that to uh, deal with our social challenges and infrastructure challenges. So again, thank you for having me on and uh, uh, don't forget to vote in October. And Amar Ditsoli. The challenges our city is facing may seem uh, daunting to someone, but they can be tackled. What we need is someone who's a bridge builder someone who is a collaborator, someone who believes in building consensus. I bring my experience to the table. That experience includes being a city councilor for eight years. That experience includes being a member of parliament and also leading two major economic portfolios, building our cities across, across this nation. But I also have a lived experience. I have made tough choices in my life. I know how to stretch a dollar. I know what it means to live in poverty. Well, I know what it means when you don't have access to services and programs because they have held me back. And because of the, this city's ability to provide equality services, I was propelled to succeed. That is my vision for Edmonton. Edmonton where all of us succeed. Edmonton for all of us building it together. So thank you so much for having us today. And thank you to everyone who participated today. Diana? So you can find me at dianasteel.ca. I did put my address in the chat there. Um, my phone number is also on my website. It's becoming a little bit of a running joke. I really do answer all of my calls. So if you phone me, you will get me on the phone. <laughs> um, but reach out anytime. I am an advocate for you 100%. So thank you so much for having me here today. And I do look forward to hearing from you so that I can learn about more ways about how I may assist you. Thank you. And Cheryl Watson. Thank you. I'm a born and raised Edmontonian and I'm not a career politician. I'm going to bring fresh perspective and an everyday Edmontonian lens someone who has lived in this, in city, this city in their entire life. And that's what our city really needs right now is fresh perspective, new ways of doing things. We can't be satisfied to settle for the current state. Things can be better. And I want to help build a Edmonton for all Edmontonians that considers place, a city that we can all be proud of, that's inclusive and accessible partnerships, working with organizations in this city, other orders of government, private industry, nonprofits, all knowing our role and the role that we play in helping uh, create a great city. And then third, potential. We have an incredible potential. We have, we're an academic powerhouse. We're a city of small and medium businesses. And I wanna create the right environment for businesses to set up here and for those students and all Edmontonians to find a place to work and live and have a healthy and safe future. Check out my website at CherylWatson.ca. And I actually just announced a smarter construction policy today that if many of you have been struggling with navigating sidewalks and pathway systems, I think that you'll see this is a really practical solution to reducing some of the barriers within our city. Thank you again to all the candidates for joining us. Uh, we're almost on time. And with that, I'll let everyone go to lunch. So thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Nice to see you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank everyone. You. Bye. Bye. Love you.
Bye.